Well, good morning again, church. Thank you for joining us as we continue our study in Genesis. And some of you may look there and go, six, we just finished four last week. And if you read ahead, you went into five and you realize that five is a genealogy chapter. And we're not skipping five. We're just not going to spend a whole day on five. And so I wanted to give us a brief synopsis here where we left off last week. Cain had killed his brother Abel, murdered him, and then lied about it and tried to hide it from God. God then punishes Cain by telling him that he would be given a mark and left out to go suffer in the wilderness and, and told that no one is allowed to touch him. Uh, but right after that, we saw that Adam again had another son, and that son was named Seth. And then the chapter 5 goes into the line of Seth and talks about all of the generations that come from Seth, including uh, one of everybody's favorite biblical characters, right? Methuselah, which without cheating... Close. I mean, no, Close, but still wrong. 969. I said 969. There it is. 969. There it is. 969 years, uh, which I don't think any of us are rooting for that long. Jeannie, I know what you're trying to come off of. You're trying to add what, how old he was when he had his son, which he was 187 years old when he had his first son, but it says that he lived 782 years after that son. For a total of 969 years, and a lot of times people will take 969 and add it to 187. We have now degraded down to third grade math, in case you were wondering. Uh, if anybody needs extra help, Mr. Perez will be in the back later. So, so we get through these characters that are living hundreds of years, 900, 800, 700 years. And uh, raise your hand, anybody willing to go back to that? Anybody want to pull out 900 years? Yes, ma'am, I see her back there. Of course, that doesn't seem that long at your age, so... Uh, for some of our other ones in here, not so much wanting to pull that one off, right? Uh, so we see this, that the line of Seth, this line runs for thousands of years, and there are many offspring that come from it. And eventually we find one after Lamech, and we see his name is Noah. And it says this in chapter 5, verse 29. He named him Noah, saying, This one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. And so we introduce into Noah. Noah was 500 years old. This is verse 32 of chapter 5. And he fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so at 500 years, he's got these three boys. And I can't imagine, you know, number one, I can't imagine having kids at 37 after already having my two. I can't imagine having a new one at this point. I can't imagine at 500 having three boys running around and what's going to go with that. Not to mention what's going to happen next. And so here's where we start at chapter 6. It says, when mankind began to multiply the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were beautiful and they took as they chose wives for themselves. And the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be limited to 120 years. And so that's the first point we see the limit put on age. And so from that point forward, the ages would be limited. But Noah, obviously, we're going to see here, isn't in that yet. So his age will allow it to be extended out. It says also, the Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterwards. And when the sons of God came to the daughters of man who bore the children, then they were powerful men of old, the famous men. And so what we see here in chapter 6 is sort of the first step of the intermarrying of groups that God has said, don't intermarry with, right? We see this happen later when we look at the entrance of the Israelites into the, to the land. When they see them come into the promised land, they're given a few simple rules by God, right? When they come into the promised land. Number one, I'm the Lord your God. You will worship me above anything else. Number two is what? Don't intermarry with the people around you. And it took them about what seems like eight seconds to break rule number two, right? They instantly start intermarrying with the people around them, and it then begins a path downhill as quickly as possible, right? Humanity, if left to our own devices, we will work our way to the bottom as quickly as possible, right? And so we see this is what's happening here. They're intermarrying, as it says here, with the, the sons of God. They're also intermarrying with the Canaanites, those that are from the descendants of Cain. They're intermarrying with people that aren't of God. And so we look at that for our lives. There's a reason scripturally it tells us that as believers, we are supposed to be equally yoked to those attached to us. If you were here on Wednesday, we talked about that Jeremiah was given a prophecy to tell the leadership of God to wear the yoke of God. 
When we think about that word yoke is used multiple times in Scripture, we have to know what a yoke is to begin with. It's a piece of wood or some sort of way that you would attach two animals together so that they could be more effective together than they were separate, or you would attach the yoke to a single animal so that it could do the work necessary so that you could control and move that animal. Yet we see scripturally in the New Testament where Christ says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because let me tell you something here today, church. You are going to put a yoke on yourself one way or the other. It is either the yoke of God or it's the yoke of the world. Something is going to control you. You've got to choose what it is. And so we see here the world is quickly working its way towards the bottom. And we see more people wearing the yoke of the world than the yoke of God. And they're intermarrying with those that aren't of God. And this is why that's so important. Because if we're honest with ourselves, church, most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, can either have been or have seen those that are Christ followers enter into relationship with those that are not Christ followers. And yes, I fully admit there are those in here that could tell you, hey, it worked. The other person got saved. We grow, grow closer to the Lord. Yes, it is possible. I am not saying that it is not. What I am telling you is, is that the statistics and the numbers tell us it usually goes the other way. The Christ follower will compromise themselves and their faith for the sake of the other person. It will usually go the other direction. And so what I tell people all the time is, would you do something if you knew it had a 90% chance of failure? And more often than not, people say no. Right? If you went to Six Flags today and you walked up to the Iron Rattler and they told you, hey, good news, bad news. Good news is we're going to let the ride run. Bad news, 90% chance the roller coaster destroys itself on the first hill. Anybody getting on? I don't think so. Yet when we look at the numbers and it shows us that around 90% of relationships that are unequally yoked don't lead to someone knowing the Lord, people still line up for it. Because we want to lower the standard. We want to work our way to the bottom in our humanity. And so we see that's what's happening here. Verse 5 picks up. When the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every scheme in his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. So pause there for a minute. It's not like here where people would say, oh, well, God's just punishing the good with the bad. No, it says here that God waited until what? Every scheme of man was evil all the time. So this goes back. We think other places we've seen this in Scripture where God's casting judgment on a city or a people group. What does he wait for? He waits for all of them. Right? You look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? When Sodom and Gomorrah was told they were going to be judged, he called the two. He said, he called, he said, leave, leave. He called the one, leave. He gathered his family, began to leave, and they said, but wait, God, if we could just find some more, would you spare the city? And God says, yeah, if you can find a group, I'll spare the city. And they went and couldn't find a group. So what did they begin to do? They begin to work their number down. And eventually they come back to God and they say, if we can just find one more righteous person in the city, will you spare the city? And God says, absolutely, you find one more righteous person. I'll spare the city. And how does the story end? They and their families leave the city as it's being destroyed because there was not one more righteous. God waits and he waits until he cannot wait anymore. Right here, he waited until every scheme in the mind of man was nothing but evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. His heart is broken. His heart is hurting. Verse 7. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off the face of the earth man whom I created together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God here, regretting what he has done, is ready to wipe him off, yet he sees Noah and says, you're telling me there's a chance. All right? For the movie fans out there, right? So you're telling me there's a chance. 
Noah, however, sees favor. And so we see this in verse 9. In the family records of Noah, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God and Noah favor, fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It's Ham. Or if we really want to get down to the, or the Hebrew, it would be Ham. And so, it's, you know, I, I like Hebrew. It's throaty, but you can't use it all the time because it's throaty. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. Or some scriptures may say injustice. Interchangeable there. God saw how corrupt the earth was for all the flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all flesh. For the earth is filled with injustice or violence because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Now, if you're Noah here, you have to have a moment of pause because what has God told you? Everybody's done. And so if you're Noah here, what's instantly in your head? If you're me, at least, if I'm in Noah's shoes, I'm going, I could have done without this information, right? Just do it, right? Don't tell me, just go on with it. Yet we see here at 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. Now, I'm going to translate. Some of you, uh, most of you, I'll actually ask this. How many of your scriptures use this in cubits? When you're about to read ahead, you've got cubits. Anybody have it in feet? Some of you, good. I'm glad. I'm going to give it to you in feet. I can also give it to you in cubits later if you want. Okay? So this is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof. Finishing the sides of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. So what that means, finishing the sides, means you are to make this thing waterproof. Up to 18 inches within the top of the roof. So he is to finish 43 feet of this ark. Which tells me that the water line is going to be where? Somewhere around that mark. That means for the most part, this ark is going to be running underwater. Right? So, unfortunately, sometimes when we see the pictures of the ark, we have the picture of the water sort of being calm and this boat sitting on top of the water and everything looks, you know, happy-go-lucky. Uh, no, what we see here is if we're asking to finish this thing to the 18 inches below the roof line, chances are this thing's going to be running low in the water. And when we realize what's being loaded into it, we would understand why it's going to run low in the water. And so then we see this. You're to finish the roof. Make it with a... You were to put a door in the side of the ark. Make it with a lower, middle, and upper deck. And so this is to be a three-decked system. As best we can tell, there might have been different things or different rooms inside of those. Obviously, there were. Uh, but that's what we see. So he's given these instructions to do this, to build this ark. 45 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, to do all of these things. If you're Noah here, again, there's the old Bill Cosby skit that talks about this, but it also really does sort of seem true. You have to imagine Noah sitting here going, okay, how? Right? What do I do? I build this ark. This is what it's supposed to be out of gopher wood. Okay, what is this going to look like? God answers that question with this. Understand that I am bringing a deluge, flood waters on the earth to destroy all the flesh under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on the earth will die. Notice the one bit of information God has not yet offered to Noah. Has anybody caught that yet? What is the one thing God has not yet offered to Noah? When? When is this coming? Imagine if you're told, build this ark because I'm going to flood the earth. When? Well, if we study scripture and we think about this, what could we imagine the answer is? Probably right around the time Noah's going to be finished building the ark. If Noah stays faithful and does what he's supposed to do, that's when the flood's going to come. If Noah isn't faithful and doesn't do what God's calling him to do, it's going to come a lot sooner. You think about that for our lives. There are things God will hold off on allowing you to go through until the time is right. That does not mean you are not going to go through them. What it means is that God will wait until you are ready. But you're still going to have to go through them. As we talked about in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about Daniel. And what's one of the things, you know, we talk about the life of Daniel and what he endured. He endured the lion's den. 
He survived the lion's den, but what did he still have to do? He had to walk into a lion's den with lions that had been starved and were hungry. God saved him from that, but he still had to walk in. God's telling Noah, I'm going to take care of you if you build this ark, but I'm still going to flood the earth. 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife and your son's wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of every living thing of all flesh, male and female to keep them alive with you. Now, obviously, we get this idea of two and we're going to see here in a minute that it was more than two. Right. But God's lead, you're to bring two. And it's really what it says in the Hebrew is you're to bring a, at least two. At least two of every living thing of all flesh, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from every animal that crawls on the ground according to its kind, will come to you so that you can keep them alive. It's easy for us to think about this when we see the pictures of Noah's Ark, right? Because when we see the pictures of it that we put together, what does it look like? Right? If you have a children's bolt in front of you, it probably looks very close to what we do with our humanistic version of it, right? There's an ark and it's like a giraffe and like maybe some hippos and, and maybe some lions on there walking in, but everybody looks orderly and walking up, right? We don't think about some of the things that this means, right? This means snakes, right? And not the snakes that we're okay with, right? This means like cobras and puff adders and all these things that will kill us are coming on board this ship, and he's called to keep it alive. He's talking about cassowary birds, right? And some of you are like, what's a cassowary bird? Go to the San Antonio Zoo and look at a cassowary bird. Better yet, Google it, because if one killed the guy in Dallas like two years ago, right? They're velociraptors. You look at a velociraptor from Jurassic Park, that's a cassowary bird today, right? That means that's coming on board, right? That means hippos are coming on board, which we have this whole idea of, oh, hippos, nice and lovely. What's the most dangerous animal in Africa? It bounces back between hippos and water buffaloes, right? So we think about these things where we're like, oh, it's just this nice menagerie of animals. No, these are things that kill humans. And all of it's going to be on the ship with you. And not only that, it's your job to what? Keep them alive. 21, take with you every kind of food that is eaten. Gather it as food for you and for them. So notice there, people ask all the time, well, how did the animals stay alive on the ark? Because God told Noah to do what? Take food for them. And Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. Now we're going to jump in. I know it says six and you're like, hey, we're done. We've gotten to six. No, we're actually moving forward a little bit. We're going to. Keep going into seven. Then Noah said, the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. You are to take with you seven pairs, a male and its female of all the clean animals and two of the animals that are not clean, a male and its female and seven pairs, male and female of the birds of the sky in order to keep offspring alive on the face of the whole earth. So notice there, it's not just, it's at least two of everything, but it is way more than that. So as we continue and look at that, it says seven days, verse four, seven days from now, I will make it rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. I will wipe off the face of the earth every living thing I have made. Notice there, 40 days and 40 nights of rain might sound pretty good to us right now, right? But as dry as our land is. But what that means for them is God is flooding the entirety of the earth. And there are some that say, and I don't, I don't necessarily think this is wrong, so I don't think you're wrong if you take this mentality on it. To this point in Scripture, we don't see rain. There are those that will tell you this is the first time rain appears scripturally or biblically. And I'm not saying you're wrong in that. I'm just saying I don't know for sure. I can't prove it. But I can imagine it being true. What I do know here is it says that for nothing else, that seven days from this point, God's going to flood the earth. He's going to make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. So even if they had seen rain to this point, they haven't seen rain on this level. You imagine for us here, right? You imagine back, and I know this sounds weird. 
July this past summer, right? What happened? It rained. It rained hard. Right? If you've seen the pictures, my family and I were blessed enough to be able to go down to Rockport and enjoy a beach house. Then Rockport tried to kill us. Right? It was one of those things where literally we walked outside, we looked at Courtney's van, and we were like, if we don't leave now, we're not leaving. We'll be stuck. Because it rained hard for two days. For two days, it rained hard, and it was get out of town or else. You imagine 40 days and 40 nights of raining hard. Noah does what he's told. Noah was 600 years old when the deluge came and the water covered the earth. So Noah, his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives entered the ark because of the waters of the deluge. From the clean animals, unclean animals, birds, and every creature that crawls on the ground, two of each, male and female, entered the ark with Noah, just as God had commanded him. Seven days later, the waters of the deluge came on the earth. And so we pause there for a moment just to think about that, that Noah loads the ark. Everybody gets on board and they close the doors. And what happens? Nothing. For seven days, they sat in that ark and waited. Imagine what the people were saying about Noah in those seven days. Right? It's easy for us to think they were making fun of him while he was building it. But imagine what they were saying if Noah had been telling them from the beginning, God's called me to build an ark because he's going to flood the earth. You need to get right. Imagine what they thought about him. And then the day he loads the ark, right? Because a lot of times we see this in our modern culture too, right? We see that as Noah is loading the ark, what is happening? Raindrops beginning to fall, right? Like, oh, it's starting as he's loading the boat. What we see here scripturally is, no, he loaded it. Then what? Seven days between him loading to the beginning of the day. Imagine what the people said about Noah as he's loading his boat, telling folks, this is what's going to happen. Right? If you had a modern, modern news cycle there, they would have been there to see the ark being loaded. And then when the doors closed and the rain didn't start, what would have been scrolling across the bottom? Local crazy man misses weather prediction, right? But seven days later, when the rain begins to fall, what happens? Now, all of a sudden, we can imagine that the people are at Noah's door doing what? Please, please let me in. In the same way today, you know people in your lives that don't know Christ. And they may be mocking you, and they may make fun of you, and they may refuse to hang out with you because of your faith. But there's going to come a time when the door shuts and the rain starts. My challenge to you today is to do everything in your power now to share Christ with them so that there doesn't come a moment in their life where they're beating on the door and it's too late. That they had their chance and they missed. Don't find yourself on the other side of that door saying, I wish I had done more. Think about those in your life today that need to hear the word of God, that need to hear the truth of God, that need to feel the love of God. And today, reach out to them and let them know about a God that loves them and offered himself up for them. And if you're here today, and you've never accepted and began that relationship with the God that loves you and gave himself for you, then today is the day. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And let me tell you right now, he is good. As I said at the beginning, I don't know all the questions, but I know the answer is Jesus. And if you're here today and you're struggling and you've got questions, I would love to tell you about the answer. In a few moments come and let's chat and let's pray and let's begin that relationship. 
If you're here today and you've accepted Christ, but God's calling you into relationship with your church or this church, come and join us. Whatever it is God's laid upon you, He's knocking. It's time for us to answer the door. Let us pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that you stand at the door and knock. God, I pray that those that are here that have not yet answered the door would answer, would accept you as Lord and Savior, would begin that relationship, would admit sinfulness, and accept the gift you offer. God, for those that you're calling into relationship with our church, we thank you for that. God, we say very clearly that whether you're a member on paper or not, if you're here, you're part of the family and we love you. God, if you're calling somebody to make it official, to put it down on paper, to join in, in relationship with this church, then God, we thank you for that as well. God, for all the hearts, all the situations going on in this room, God, I don't know, like I said, I don't know all the questions, I don't know all the concerns, but I know you are the answer. So I pray that we would seek you, because you alone are good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us, church.